How is everyone doing? Um, really excited to be here. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon for uh, yet another virtual installment of Startup Grind. Uh, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to be back in person, uh, mostly because I miss the uh, the pizza and drinks. I never thought I would miss pizza and beer as much as I do after not being able to go to an event in New York City uh, for more than a year. Uh, but we are here again, virtual startup grind, uh, this time with an entrepreneur who is truly doing her part to make the world a better place. Um, and we're very excited to talk with her. Uh, my name is Joshua Ness, and I'm the director here at Startup Grind New York City. I'm also a senior manager at Verizon 5G Labs, where I work with startups, academia, and enterprise teams to build a 5G-powered world. Startup Grind is the world's largest community of startups, founders, innovators, and creators, bringing like-minded and diverse individuals together to give startups everywhere the education, opportunities, and access they need to build, grow, and scale their companies. And part of being on the Startup Grind team means having, be, means having meaningful conversations like this that address certain aspects of building a company and how to deal with the grind that goes along with entrepreneurship. And we also talk to experts about the advancement of technology, as well as exploring barriers to inclusion and how to create opportunities for representation and allyship in the community. Now, at the end of the day, we try to live up to Startup Grind's global values. We believe in making friends, not contacts. We believe in giving instead of taking. And we believe in helping others before you help yourself. Having said all that, I am very excited to introduce Anya Ranganathan, the co-founder of Bad Apple Produce. Anya, how are you today? Well, thanks for having me, Josh. I'm doing fantastic. And just to give a little bit of context on myself, um, as Josh mentioned, my name is Anya Ranganathan, and I'm the co-founder and general manager of Bad Apple Produce. And the company Bad Apple Produce is essentially an online grocery delivery service with a mission to strengthen the local food system. Um, and the main way we do this is by sourcing our groceries exclusively from farms and food businesses within 150 miles of New York City. But our values and ethos are really grounded in sustainability. So we often source surplus groceries to reduce food waste in the local supply chain. And in our warehouse, we exclusively use non-plastic packaging materials, um, which is really kind of a different approach than many other grocery service delivery services are using right now. Um, and during COVID-19, we really worked on strengthening our partnerships with local nonprofits like City Harvest and Food Bank for New York City. And since launching in 2019, we've recovered over a quarter of a million pounds of food from ending up in landfills and have donated over 50,000 pounds to different hunger relief organizations. Wow, that is impressive. Uh, I'm excited to dive into some of that, especially that sustainability aspect of it uh, here in a little bit. Um, as, we kick, as we kick things off, uh, please make sure to drop your questions in the chat. We'll be answering these throughout today's conversation. Uh, we'll also have an opportunity at the end of the conversation for you to tell the rest of us who you are and what you're working on and where you need help or how you can help others if you have some help to give. Uh, to kick things off, Anya, tell me how you went from being of all things, a financial analyst to launching a food sustainability startup. Those two don't, <laughs> they don't seem to jive. Like how do you go from one to the other? And and, and was it like an, a, a moment of like throwing your papers and hands up in the air and being like, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go do something completely different. Absolutely. I, I get that feedback a lot. People are like, how did you go from working on Wall Street to running a sustainable grocery delivery service. What is the connection between those two things? Um, and really the beginning of my entrepreneurship journey started when I was in college. Um, I did my undergrad at Duke in North Carolina. And when I was a sophomore in college, I actually was interning for the local government in North Carolina. And I was focusing on agriculture research, which ultimately led me and a friend to founding a company that essentially was a farm to doorstep delivery service. Now, I ended up, you know, working with that company for two years throughout my time in college. Uh, we entered the Duke Startup Challenge and actually ended up winning about $50,000 to scale our idea. But ultimately, I didn't end up staying on with that startup after I graduated because of financial constraints. I wasn't really in a position to, to not take a salary for any period of time. Um, 
So I chose to work um, in commodities sales and trading of all things because I really wanted to remain adjacent to the food industry. Um, but also I wanted to kind of keep thinking about this issue of agriculture supply chains. And I'm sure, you know, to the average person, it's like, what is commodities sales and trading? What does that actually mean? Um, I always like to explain my old job by saying that if you've ever watched the movie uh, Trading Places, you know what I used to do for a living. I worked on a trading floor. I'm communicated with all sorts of clients um, from large financial institutions to large food companies like General Mills um, and kind of pitched um, trades on different products. Um, now, I was doing this for about three months when I realized that while I really loved the energy of the trading floor, that one, the work was a bit bureaucratic and I really missed the kind of hustle and bustle of launching a venture from scratch and, and getting it up and running. Um, but I also kind of wanted to reposition my career trajectory in the social impact sphere. Um, and, you know, simultaneously, I just moved to New York City and internalized just how expensive and difficult it was to go grocery shopping. You know, I lived in a fifth floor walk up and was constantly lugging you know, 20 pounds of groceries up the stairs. And, and so, you know, these ideas were kind of all percolating in my head and the idea for Bad Apple started to take shape. So um, about three months into my job, I took a sick day and I actually cold called every major food distributor in New York City looking for support on this venture. Um, and that led me to come into contact with Bad Apple's um, lead investor and, and now my co-owner in the company. Um, so about eight months after that initial conversation, I left my full-time job uh, to launch Bad Apple in July 2018. Wow, that is impressive. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know Trading Places, that is uh, uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Eddie Murphy, uh, yeah. and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, one of Jamie Lee Curtis's first roles. Um, and if you, have, if you ever want to know what it's really like on Wall Street, then <laughs> definitely watch Trading Places. It, it's a it's a fantastic movie. Trading. So they, in in the movie, they trade orange juice commodities. Is that were, were you were you trading orange juice? Yeah, we did actually have some live deals in frozen concentrated orange juice. So that was not an exaggeration. That is <laughs> actually done. <laughs> That is amazing. And so, when you cold called all of those investors on 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 that on that sick day, taking a sick day, which like there's a whole story in there on its own. Like, how many callbacks did you get from all of these cold calls? Like, what was your rate of return? Yeah. So I think this is really a testament to the fact that you can have dozens of people say no to you, and the yes that you get is the yes that really matters. Um, I, you know contacted about two dozen folks who I thought might be in a position to support this kind of venture. Um, and I got a response from one person. And that one person is the person who invested in my company. Wow. Yeah. That's all right. There's, 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 the, there's, there's payoff at the end of the hustle. I'll tell you what. So what did you, what did you learn from that time that you spent in finance? Were there any lessons that carried over? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that in general, um, I think folks that are interested in entrepreneurship sometimes feel you know, upset about having to take corporate jobs at first because of logistical constraints. But I really think that my time in finance is a testament to the fact that um, there are lots of transferable skills in corporate workplaces to entrepreneurship. And I think one of the biggest insights that has helped me a lot um, in running a company has been this concept of really obsessing over your customer and their needs. So, you know, when I was working in commodities sales, uh, it's an industry where, you know, every major bank can provide this service. There's nothing really unique about the service that's provided from bank to bank from a pure like product offering perspective. But what really differentiates one bank from another is how well the salesperson knows the customer, any unique insights they're able to provide, any unique insights they have on the client's personality so they know maybe not to bother them at a certain time of day and to kind of engage with them at other times of the day. That's really the unique value add. And so that actually transferred over really well to me launching a company in a sector with low barriers to entry and somewhat uniform product offerings. You know, to a certain extent, most grocery delivery services offer similar brands. Um, and so, you know, 
I think that this concept of customer obsession and really focusing on who's your client, what do they want, what do they really value about your service carried over quite nicely. So I think you're right there. Like for so often, like you mentioned that the companies end up failing because a founder has this idea of what the long-term vision of a company is going to be and has this idea of what value is being brought into the market without ever having really truly tested it. Like you can do, you, you can, I mean, as a founder, we can do um, market testing and we can do um, uh, uh, it, like willingness to purchase testing, right? But at the end of the day, until it's actually put into the market, do we realize as founders that either A, my idea was spot on or much more often B, wow, my idea needs to pivot a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you a you know, really specific example from, from Bad Apple. You know, when we first launched our service, we thought that in a high cost of living city, that price would be a huge concern of our customer base. And so in our sourcing strategy, we really focused on sourcing mostly from wholesalers that offered more conventional products and really making sure that our pricing was very, very competitive relative to our you know, folks that were also providing similar services. But as we started to get feedback trickling in from our customers, price wasn't actually really the main pushing point in why they valued our service. Um, customers were actually willing to pay more money for our product and they wanted a lot more local and organic offerings um, from us. And so during COVID and in the couple of months before it, we really significantly expanded our local and organic availability. And that in turn really increased our reorder rate quite significantly. And so I think that it's very important for founders not to have really fixed notions of what value it is that they're delivering and really be willing to change strategy based on the feedback that you're getting. It's a very iterative process. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting also then to realize that your market isn't as price sensitive as, as, as you thought they were, as long as they're getting, as you're, as they are getting the things and you're providing them with the things that they, that they otherwise struggle with. Uh, Cause yeah, that, that's that's a really interesting lesson to learn, especially as as we go in thinking that um, that there is price sensitivity, where in fact we often as founders don't don't think about um, are we actually creating a a painkiller instead of a vitamin? Are we giving somebody that they somebody something that they otherwise would would pay a good amount of money for because it's something we're actually addressing a need or addressing a gap in their lives? Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a really important insight, I think. Well, now that we that we that you got that far and you you realized all of these things, I imagine that you you haven't necessarily been able to do it by yourself. I imagine that uh, a, a company like Bad Apple Produce is successful because not only of the attention that you're paying to your market, but because of these partnerships that you've had to establish with um, a, such a wide variety of of players in the industry. Um, how do you, how did you go about finding and getting all these partners on board? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's an extremely good question, and I mean, really, our entire business model is contingent on buy in from farms, wholesalers, donation partners. We're really not able to deliver the value that we deliver without a lot of cooperation and collaboration. And so, in terms of initially identifying these partners, it's really all about staying plugged into different communities where our stakeholders would kind of naturally congregate. Um, food tech communities, conferences, social impact communities, you're really only able to, to build as many partnerships as you're able to visualize. And so I think that just staying tapped into communities is, is very important. In terms of actually converting those you know, potential partnerships into you know, formal relationships. Um, I found that especially if you're kind of a, a startup style organization that maybe has more limited resources, you have to be really explicit about how the other party stands to benefit from partnering you and what you can bring to the table um, that's unique. You know, ultimately, what's the unique value proposition of working with you? Um, and so 
I'll give you an example. Um, we have a recurring partnership with an organization called Snack, which is a New York based nonprofit that provides nutrition and culinary education to low income um, middle schoolers in the South Bronx. It's a fantastic organization. And in the initial stages of our conversation, the organization was also talking to other grocery delivery services to provide them with assistance. But we were really able to communicate that, you know, because of our sourcing model, the fact that we often source excess supply, um, we can offer you, you know, 30% lower costs than the competitors of ours that you're chatting with. And also because we're a startup, we can kind of provide you with more customized service than a large company. So it was really, you know, highlighting the unique aspects of our service that helped us overcome the organization's hesitation to partner with us because we weren't as established with some of these other folks. So I think that, you know, anybody that's looking to forging business relationships with people, you really have to have that unique value proposition memorized and to be able to state it in a way that would resonate with the other party. Have you, I think that's so true because we're, you're not necessarily only addressing and I think in any startup, you're not only necessarily addressing the needs of your customers, but you have to be looking, thinking about the needs of your partners as well. Um, do you find that, it, that at any times those needs diverge, that the needs of a partner organization or a potential partner organization would end up being antithetical to the needs of who your customers are? Sometimes. Um, I think that typically a lot of when the needs of our partners and our needs as an organization or the needs of customers diverge, um, is is typically due to scaling issues. So sometimes, you know, the partner organization has too large of a supply and it doesn't quite match with our customer base. So if we were to take all of that inventory, we wouldn't necessarily be able to distribute it in an efficient enough manner for that to make sense. Um, sometimes also in the perishables industry, um, an organization may have an item that's highly perishable that is edible today, but tomorrow or the next day, it, it may not be in the proper quality to distribute, in which case there's there's a bit of a timing issue. You know, we're not necessarily in a position to send somebody an item that they're paying for that can't be eaten for, a, you know, can't be stored in your fridge for at least, you know, three days. And so that's typically where it diverges. But, you know, when you're a mission-driven organization, a big part of our value is kind of curating this ecosystem. And so when we have a partner that has a need that doesn't directly align with our customers, we can typically connect them with another organization that's better suited to work with them. Oh, that's interesting. So you're then in that case, as a as an organization that's looking out for the values and needs of, of all of your stakeholders, uh, including your customers, uh, you're able to act as almost a, a broker uh, and, 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 and create pathways for um, not only business to get done, but for that value to be transferred and created. Exactly. Nice. Um, so was there, was there a critical mass or have you reached a critical mass where you can say that we, that, that it becomes easier to get partners involved? Um, I imagine at the very beginning, it's, it's hard. Um, but did you reach a point where you were working with enough, uh, enough types of partners to where it became, let's say, less hard? I don't want to say easy. <laughs> I'm sure it's not ever easy. But it became less hard um, to, 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 to communicate credibility, um, to communicate validity, um, and, and be able to, to get these new folks on board. Yes, very much the case. I think that most businesses sort of reach an inflection point where they've kind of amassed a critical um, either amount of media appearances or specific relationships they have that sort of put a stamp of credibility on the work that they do. Um, and for us, you know, we, we pretty actively work with Food Bank for New York City and City Harvest. So in terms of um, the more mission driven ends of our partnerships, typically when we're able to say that we work with two of the most high pro profile hunger relief organizations on the East Coast, um, folks are typically understanding that we have the infrastructure to be able to maintain partnerships well. Um, and I think this really as a kind of lesson point, like we weren't there when we first launched and it took a while to sort of build up the infrastructure to be able to work with organizations like food bank and city harvest so i always encourage people not to be discouraged if you get a no at first it's really about incrementally 
developing partnerships and relationships to ultimately secure the goal partnerships and relationships. And I imagine in those cases, when you, when you do get the no, it's about understanding where that no is coming from and, and being able to, to understand that there's this concept of right partner, wrong time. And how can we go as a company, either work with additional partners or rethink our approach to, to, more, to more closely align with the values of that particular stakeholder? Exactly. And I think that at the end of the day, especially in the food industry, which um, has a lot of log logistical constraints to it by virtue of the perishability of food, as well as kind of the infrastructure and care that's required to handle and transport it. Um, oftentimes, the no's that you get in terms of partnerships are not because there's not values alignment. It's often because um, of purely logistical or infrastructure issues. Um, so I think that is really what drives our desire to connect with as many people as possible in the industry. Because once again, you know, if we are not in a position to address a need of another organization on our own, sometimes we can partner with other organizations to be intermediaries um, or connect somebody um, with another organization that's better suited. Nice, that's, that's great. Uh, how has it been, I imagine in, in those instances, it seems very like, it seems very objective, right? It's um, a, 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 an organization needs or wants a certain thing, you're able to provide a certain thing, um, whether that's investors or whether that's partners or whether that's other stakeholders, things like that. But sometimes it, it I feel like it can kind of come down to um, like who's in the room uh, and, 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 being a founder is 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 never easy. Um, and I think in some instances it 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 might be harder than it needs to be. Um, and, and I'm curious what your experience has been like that, like when you're actually being in the room. Like, have you had to deal with um, with any uh, preconceived notions, or like as as you as you are a a, a woman fairly fresh out of uh, a fairly new, newly out of, out of out of university, walking in saying, "I have this idea for an impact driven business." Like, what were people's reactions to that, and like, what did you have to what how did you have to sell them on that, or what did you have to deal with? Yeah, I mean, it is a real and documented fact that first of all, um, women in general have only raised, you know, about last year, about 2% of all funding raised. The stats are even lower for women of color, um, particularly um, black and Latinx women as well. So I, I do wanna absolutely emphasize the disparities with regards to funding. Um, they're prominent and real. And a big part of the reason why that's the case is because of preconceived notions of who is capable of running a business who has ideas that are worth validating with uh, funding. Um, but also I think that in general, this is something that's also been backed by a lot of psychology research. Men in general tend to be judged based on their potential, um, especially when it comes to promotions in the corporate workplace or in entrepreneurship, whereas women are much more likely to be judged based on what they've actually achieved. And this creates a real kind of catch 22 because oftentimes when you kind of come into entrepreneurship and you're seeking out funding, it is important to have some sort of traction data or validation of the concept. And so even though, you know, this double standard is very unfair, I kind of use this fact to motivate myself and I really remind myself that I need to make sure that I have a very data-driven approach in the way that I pursue entrepreneurship. You know, if I'm starting a venture, I wanna make sure that the numbers are clear, um, everything that we um, put forth, whether it's the design of our website or the nature of our branding and the language that we use to reach out to our customers um, is researched. Um, and my thought process is that if I come into the room and I have my facts straight and I have data backing my claims and I've done three times as much research as the founder who was in the room pitching before me, then it's kind of difficult 
to brush aside that. Um, and I want, you know, in a more aspirational sense, I would love for us to live in a world where women and minority entrepreneurs did not have to do three times as much work um, to, to be able to secure, what, 2% of the funds that are doled out every year. And so that's why I'm really passionate about mentorship, um, specifically in the entrepreneurship community. Um, and in general, you know, if any female or minority founders reach out to me for advice, for assistance, um, I answer that call, I answer that email, I give them advice on how to structure their pitch deck. Um, I think all of this is extremely important. Yeah, as a as a community, we we understand that it is important to to pay it forward, uh, which is a cliche, of course, phrase, but it it really does. I think in so many so many times the success of new ventures is dependent upon the willingness and, and the ability of the people who came before to share that knowledge, which is a big part of what we do here at Startup, right? We're, we're always very honored every month when we have someone like yourself who comes in with unique lessons and unique perspectives and unique um, viewpoints of, of, um, of how they've structured their business and how they've, um, how they've, uh, how they have recognized uh, their, their success. Who has that been for you? I think that I've had a number of really fantastic mentors kind of in my startup journey, um, one of which actually is my uh, co-owner and investor who prior to investing in our company um, led a and is continuing to lead a 300 person company um, in the food industry through a period of vast transformation. I mean, COVID has really significantly impacted the way that food companies operate. And I think the the faith that she put in me, um, coupled with the different insights that she's be able she's able to provide me as you know a female um, business owner in a very male dominated industry have been very grounding um, as I've kind of gone through my uh, latest uh, entrepreneurship experience. So I really emphasize the importance of finding people who are willing to champion you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's that's very important to to find those people and then also to be those people. Yeah. Um, one of my mantras when I when I first moved to New York, uh, I moved here with no job, no friends, no place to live, um, thinking that I was going to take my undergrad degree in finance and economics and I was going to use that to be a social media consultant um, because I knew how to use Facebook. I knew how to use Twitter. This is before you had to pay for everything. Um, and as I was doing research and I was looking at what current so social media consultants at the time were um, were doing and what sort of experience they had, I got very discouraged and frustrated. And um, and I remember somebody somebody said to me uh, that that was that was a it was it was good to recognize that, but um, that shouldn't be a uh, dissuading factor because and this is what she said. She said uh, to every third grader. A fourth grader is a god. And the lesson there is that even though you might not think that you have it all figured out, even though you might have your own fears and frustrations, you still know more than you did yesterday. And you know more than you did a year ago. And there are people out there who are starting out where you were starting out. And um, just because you might not think that you're at that mentorship level, uh, that mentor level, or that you're at that, um, the idea of, of, of being like, you know, the godfather of having the, the network and being able to, to, you know, people come to you for favors, um, you'd be surprised. Um, the, and the lesson there was, was to, to put myself out there and to go out there and talk about what I knew. Um, and, and eventually uh, I found people who valued what I knew enough to pay me for it. Um, and then ultimately use that to, to enter the startup community and, and, and here we are. Um, the, uh, we have, have a question in the chat. Terrence was asking um, how to balance, and we're gonna talk about impact and sustainability here in a second. Terrence, I'm actually gonna hold off on that. I'm gonna get to that in just one second. I did have a self-serving question. Um, <laughs> as, as we're thinking about, like you mentioned how it's important to listen to the market um, as you develop your brand and to um, and to use that information that the market gives you to um, sometimes pivot your unique value proposition. 
how has how has your market been talking to you during the pandemic and has anything changed? Um, and as people are moving toward, and this kind of a twofer, as people are moving toward the adoption of new types of technologies that are in some cases increasing at an accelerated pace, um, how will new technology um, capabilities change the way that you do business, either through um, things like uh, different ways to, um, to interact with the business um, or, um, or, or, or different ways for your, your partners to operate. Um, how, how has COVID changed any of that and how will the advancement of technology change that? That's a fantastic and timely question. Um, and I, I don't think you know it takes me to tell the audience uh, that obviously COVID has just vastly transformed people's expectations of, of food and grocery delivery. Um, in particular, the, the major trends that we've seen have been an increased focus on local and sustainable offerings um, with people being home more and seeing kind of the economic fallout of COVID on their local communities. People are increasingly focused on diverting their dollars towards local businesses, local growers, local food products, et cetera. Um, and also with people spending more time at home, they're more able to sort of see the impact of their purchasing behavior, you know, they see the trash pile up um, in their in their trash can more quickly. Um, they they're able to kind of better internalize what their habits are and have more time to kind of implement more sustainable changes. And so during COVID, we've gotten a lot of feedback from our customers that one give us all of the local and organic products that you can source. We're willing to pay for them. We really are. I, the pricing is less of a concern. Um, we just want a one-stop shop where we can purchase as much of this as possible. And the other point of feedback that they've gotten, that we've gotten from them is um, we're really starting to see the impact of relying on delivery and that's that there's a lot of packaging waste generated. Um, and so we previously didn't have very much plastic in our boxes, but we've now transitioned into a completely plastic free facility. Um, and we do not put any plastic packages in our boxes unless the item already comes shipped to us in plastic. So those are the two major changes that we've made. Um, with regards to new technology, um, with, with grocery delivery, I think one of the biggest kind of innovations that's happening right now, particularly in dense metro areas, is the concept of the dark store. And essentially this is a hub um, for grocery delivery that has no storefront. And it basically is a glorified warehouse that turns out orders. Um, and the thing with them is that they typically have a smaller selection of items that are sort of hyper-focused towards the local clientele. And orders are typically only shipped out within a two to three mile radius, which vastly increases the speed at which they can be delivered to a customer. So I think that um, this model is really going to impact the way that grocery delivery and the way that ultimately we do business um, in the you know six to eighteen month time frame, um, the expectations of customers as they rely more on delivery um, are shifting towards wanting things as quickly as possible. Huh? Yeah, I, I heard a, I, I, I heard an article. Do you say that? Like when I listen to a podcast, I'm like, yeah, I heard an article today. <laughs> uh, I heard an article about how ghost kitchens are. Right are popping up as just industrial or commercial kitchens that have no storefront at all. And then a like a, a an almost fake restaurant name mm -hmm. is added to something like Seamless or Grubhub. And you can order from, you know, Charlie's Chicken Shack or something where you can't, there's there is no place. You're not gonna find any map, but you can order from there that this company has almost rebranded it as a digital offering. And the, the food is cooked either on site at this existing restaurant that is a totally different restaurant or in one of these ghost kitchens, these commercial kitchens, um, and then sold under that brand name. Does, does, the, does Bad Apple Produce have the ability to begin decentralizing in that way? Uh, and 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 taking on some of the some of the better aspects of that dark store business model and delivering that kind of value to the people who want it. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of our ability to kind of pivot completely to that model, um, it's not likely something that we'd be able to do 
in the immediate time frame. However, we do feel that by partnering with existing dark stores that we may be able to um, offer some of our products through a kind of accelerated distribution model. Um, and also, you know, with most of our customer, pretty much all of our customer base being concentrated in New York City, um, it sort of opens up the possibility of potentially seeking out real estate to shift towards a model like this as we kind of gain scale. That would be, that would be interesting, uh, especially, it, especially if there was the ability for, for you to service, and you mentioned like pivoting completely and, um, and it would be interesting to, 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 to know that there was a, there was a centralized way of doing it, but then there was also this, um, the, this, additional offering. I imagine that there's a lot more that goes into that than just a conversation here on a Tuesday. Um, and, and wrapping it up on technology, ha have have there ever been instances where your customers want to have more interaction with their groceries before they get them? I'm, I ask this because I, I work in, in 5G and, and 5G as a, as a technology only is, is valuable because it enables other technologies. It's essentially like a, a connectivity platform, a, a layer. And um, one of the things that we're seeing is that it enables organizations to very quickly digitize objects and assets into 3D models and then be able to deliver them to customers or users in things like augmented reality or virtual reality or even holograms. Do you envision a day where a customer is going to want to know what their box looks like, what their grocery delivery looks like. Like, don't show me a pair, show me the pair that you're sending to me. And do you anticipate a world where um, there's going to be very, there's going to be rapid digitization of groceries that can then be put together and shown to a customer beforehand saying, this is what you're going to get. And do you, has there been any indication that your customers have any interest in something like that? So I think that this is a fantastic question. And in terms of the desire to kind of have a deeper understanding of what's been purchased, I think that's definitely the case. Um, with the industrialization of agriculture and food over the last hundred years, um, humans have kind of people in the U.S., citizens of the U.S. have gotten increasingly distanced from the actual means of production of how their food is being grown, processed, distributed, and ultimately ending up on shelves. Many people have very little visibility on that process. Now, there's kind of an increasing trend in the food industry for transparency in where a company is sourcing their ingredients, um, what sorts of certifications different growers um, and producers have. Um, and so with that push, I do believe that technology will make it much easier for consumers of grocery products to gain visibility on you know, what they might be purchasing on the store level, but also going further back, how their items are being grown or produced. Um, and that visibility will kind of be something that drives a customer to pick one product versus another. And there actually are um, large food companies that are already sort of investing in this sort of technology. So Unilever, for example, has a couple of snack portfolio companies that actually um, allow you <laughs> to be able to see the cow on the farm um, so a customer kind of feels more connected to what, what they're purchasing. Um, so I do feel that technology is going to rapidly change people's expectations of what they purchase and who they purchase from. That is a really, I hadn't even thought of that angle, the ability to not only see the pair, but see the, like be able to pop up a, 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 an image of the tree that the pair came from. Uh, and then the farm where this tree is located and the family that owns that farm. Um, there would be a really interesting way that technology can be used to give people more, um, not inside, more context into the food that they're buying. That, that would be, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. Supply chain transparency is huge right now. And I think that technology is really the best tool in our kind of increasingly complicated food world, um, where supply chains are sort of very convoluted. 
Um, I think technology is the best way to give consumers the transparency that they want. Yeah, that, I'm excited to, for, that to, for that to come around. <laughs> um, Terrence, we're going to get back to you, but um, and I think I think this just segues nicely into our uh, our next topic. Um, he was asking, how do you balance the impact uh, and sustainability mission with operational profitability? And you mentioned this when we first started talking, and you have a term for this, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. At Bad Apple Produce, we identify as a triple bottom line business. And what a triple bottom line business is a business that not just cares about fiscal sustainability, meaning being profitable. Um, it's, it's a company that also cares about environmental sustainability and also social sustainability. What um, value are we kind of bringing to the community that we're situated in? And so we have a very different calculus when we're approaching business decisions than the average company. You know, we're not just thinking, okay, we need to sell spinach on our grocery delivery service. Um, what is the cheapest spinach that I can source? And how high can I price it such that the customer is interested in purchasing the product and we get a nice profit margin in that? Our calculus is more like, okay, we need to sell spinach on our platform. It's a standard product that a lot of people would like to buy. Who are all of the different people in our kind of geographic area that we could purchase spinach from? How are they growing the spinach? Um, what sorts of agricultural practices are they using? What kind of technology are they using to reduce the um, resource intensiveness of their process? How big is the company? How many people do they employ? And do they pay them living wages? How can we get this item from their warehouse to our warehouse? Do they offer delivery or would we have to kind of head to the facility and pick it up ourselves? If we have to pick it up ourselves, is the facility kind of in our oh. radius of operations or is it so far away that we'd have to burn a lot of gas on the route and we feel like the um, environmental impact of that would be disadvantageous or not conducive to our environmental mission. So these are all of the sorts of questions that we go through when we're making sort of any decision um, in our operations. And it really is about kind of finding that balance of feeling comfortable with all of the stakeholders that we involve in our business but also making sure that we have enough cushion to remain financially profitable. Because ultimately, if we're not financially profitable, we can't act on our mission. We'll have to shut down. Right. Um, so really a big part of it is just going through the deliberative process of asking all of these questions, weighing out the pros and cons of each, and making sure that in every decision that we make that we feel comfortable that we're acting within our company values. And how not not successful have you been at that? But what has been the reaction of some of the partners that you've worked with? How have you have you ever had a situation where you wanted to buy that spinach, but they didn't meet your criteria? Did you let them know? Yeah, absolutely. So we have sort of different sets of criteria for the different partners that we have um, in terms of most of the products that we source that are perishable, we typically like to go with suppliers that either have a B Corp certi certification and the B Corp is basically um, a certification that um, highlights that a company is committed to environmental social impact and it's quantifiable and there's, there's a really rigorous process that goes into that. So we like working with B Corps. And if we can't work with a B Corp, um, we like to see that a company just has very robust data available on the different operational choices that they make and that we feel comfortable with the decisions that they've kind of undertaken. Um, and that typically involves a conversation um, about different practices that they use. Um, and even if a company isn't necessarily solely or mostly guided by sustainability or social impact, especially in the food waste reduction portion of our mission, if say Dole has leftover pineapples and they have absolutely no way of transferring them from 
their warehouse to a donor, uh, to a charitable organization. And the only way that these items are going to end up being eaten is if we take them. Ultimately, because we're a company that's committed to reducing food waste, we will take that product. It. Um, however, it's typically our desire to work with suppliers of food and of produce that um, have more robust environmental standards. Okay, that's, that's good to know that the pineapples would still find a home. Uh, how, and we know that the, I'm trying to make the tie in here. Um, I imagine that it's not easy, uh, especially um, operating a triple bottom line business. Um, ha understanding that um, the the way that you bring that you engage with stakeholders um, is sometimes different than the way that other companies might engage stakeholders. I imagine that is, is not always easy, and that it can be very difficult at times. Um, uh, not in the logistics and the tactical uh, aspect of it, but as a as a founder, um, I imagine that making these choices and committing to these values sometimes means that it's it's a struggle. It's it's a it's a grind, right? Um, how have you made it through the hard times of entrepreneurship, uh, especially when things like depression and anxiety can be serious factors for founders? It's it's such a important point um, that you raise. Um, you know, entrepreneurs are two to three times more likely to experience anxiety and depression versus the non-entrepreneur population. And I think that most folks that are entrepreneurs go through a phase where they feel drained, exhausted, emotional. And I myself have gone through, um, I went through a period of about three months um, in 2019 where I was just struggling to get out of bed, you know, was seriously dealing with depression um, linked to my venture. Um, and I think that a big part of the case why this is common of entrepreneurs is that when you start a venture, you feel that all of the successes and the failures in your venture are reflective of your value. This is the company that I started. And so if this company doesn't fail to close the round of funding that I wanted to close, it's a reflection on me, my worth. Um, and so I think that the best ways to kind of kind of deal with these sorts of challenges um, and mental health issues are one, to really tap into startup communities and to just be transparent about sharing your kind of emotional status. I mean, I think it's very common for you know folks at meetups to say, to maybe somebody they've seen a couple of times before, how are you? And us to kind of just put on a happy face and say, great, never been better. Right. Um, and, and sometimes that's just not true. And I think it's okay to be transparent and say, I've had better days, feeling a little burned out. And I think the beginning of being vulnerable tends to result in folks attempting to support you. And so, that is definitely a strategy that I've used, just being very transparent with folks about where I'm at. Um, and I'm also just a huge advocate for therapy. Um, I know that that is not necessarily something that everybody is interested in doing, but I find that even if you're not necessarily in a place where your depression or your anxiety is debilitating, you know, seeking out therapy is a really fantastic way to learn strategies for dealing with your automatic thoughts and to kind of build resilience and coping strategies. So I always recommend that as well. That is that is good advice. Uh, here, here in New York, it's almost a, a, a badge of honor to, to say that um, that you're that they, you're in therapy. I, I have issues. I'm dealing with them, um, and it's uh, and we all do. So it's um, if, if if a public service announcement. If anybody is um, feeling the, some of those feelings, then um, uh, talking to somebody about it is, is a good a good practice. Um, we did get, a, a, unrelated to that, we did get a question um, from Alex in the audience who was asking if you or any of your partners had found any financial gains from switching to sustainable practices. Um, uh, an example might be, uh, is there a financial incentive to cut down on packaging uh, that goes into your deliveries? Yeah, absolutely, that's a, that's a great question. 
So in terms of our organization, we've found that by sourcing items that typically don't make it to commercial markets, um, it actually is typically cheaper for us. Um, and we were able to sell our, our products at a lower cost because of that. But um, the, the margin structure is a little more favorable than just a standard grocery store or a standard grocery delivery service. Um, with regards to packaging, um, we have actually seen a cost reduction since switching um, solely to compostable paper packaging um, from putting a little bit of plastic into our boxes. I think one of the big challenges of why there hasn't been widespread adoption of um, non-plastic packaging in the perishables industry is because there's not a lot of technology to produce it this sort of packaging affordably at scale. And I think once more investment goes into coming up with these solutions that we'll see more companies starting to adopt them. Nice, that's good. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, as we're nearing the end of the time, uh, we talked about paying it forward um, and that, that with respect to things like entrepreneurship, but also some of the things that you talked about at the at the, the middle of the hour about um, um, being a woman in the space and um, and and minority founders and, and the uh, the struggles that they have. How are you helping to promote diversity and inclusion and, and leadership development in your position now? Absolutely. So outside of my you know time uh, working on Bad Apple Produce. I'm really deeply passionate about um, educational equity. And I think that, um, you know, you can look at the entrepreneurship space and say, you know, there's disparities, there's clearly not total equity in the space. But I think that a lot of those disparities arise from things earlier on. Um, and so that's a big part of the reason why I'm, I'm quite involved in kind of different educational educational equity initiatives. So I actually serve as a pro bono college counselor um, for underrepresented students um, in the college process. Um, I work a lot with international students. I work a lot with um, first generation college students, low income students, anybody that doesn't typically um, have a lot of personal family insight on the college process um, in the US. Um, and I work with a company called College Advisor to do that. And I think it's important because really, I mean, with the college process or with entrepreneurship, there are so many different decisions that you have to make kind of along the pipeline. And if you're not getting quality advice from someone because your network isn't such that you have three dozen people to reach out to to consult, um, the ultimate outcome might not end up as favorable for you, not because of the effort that you put into, but just because of absolute lack of resources. Um, and so for me, um, I'm, I'm really passionate about being that source of assistance for somebody. Um, because if not me, they may not be getting support from from other folks. All right. Yeah, I think a, an element of privilege, one of the one of the largest factors of privilege is is the um, is the network and and having access to people who can help you with the road ahead um, to help you achieve those goals and um, and I think I think I think that's fantastic I think, I think it's wonderful um, Anya I think uh, I think people joined to hear your story um, but they also really wanted to hear something else from you um, when when we talked uh, you had mentioned that. Um, that something about free avocados what how is this what is this what is this how does it work very elegant tie-in so um at bad apple produce we're currently running a promotion um if you sign up using the code free avo that's f-r-e-e-a-v-o um you will get twenty dollars off your first order and a free avocado in every order that you place with us for life I have seen a lot of uh, amazing promotions in my time, and I have never seen anything that special, that good. I'm definitely going to be checking that out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and and just, if people want to, I know we're a little bit past time, but Anya, if people uh, want to um, to stay in touch with Bad Apple Produce, um, uh, if they want to keep keep in touch with what you're doing and, and get inspiration, like how can we how can we keep in touch with you? Absolutely. So the two best ways are to one. Um, 
go on our website, badappleproduce.com, and sign up for our mailing list. And then the other best way to stay in touch with us is to follow us on Instagram at badappleproduce. And I will put both of those in the chat. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Anya, for this incredible dialogue and a special thank you to our audience for joining in. Uh, this conversation has been recorded and will be available in the next few days if anyone would like to share this content with their communities. Uh, we'll be back next month with more great stories from the entrepreneurship community, uh, specifically something focused around sustainability uh, and Earth Day, which is happening in April. Uh, so be on the lookout for an announcement coming soon. And you can find out more and view some of our previous interviews, including our February event, which was conducted entirely in virtual reality on startupgrind.com and searching for the NYC chapter. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>